<laughs> Thank you, Brady, for joining us today and talking about your family and your experience with FMP and National Guard Reserves lifestyle and everything post COVID. Mm -hmm. Can you give me a little bit of a background of your military story? So my husband was reserve and guard before we went active. He's been in for 14 years, uh, four years active duty. Uh, so we live now uh, on JBAB in DC. And, but we still go back every year and work with his old guard unit doing the kids camp and helping any spouses out also who transition from active duty to guard her who may want to go guard to active duty and kind of explain, you know, the process and, and that whole transition. So we're still very active. We still have friends uh, within the guard in Washington state. So yeah. kind of our background. Mm -hmm. So what do people you think don't really understand about National Guard? If, if uh, they that, they're, that they're just not a, a two week, well, a two week, a year, one week and a month. They're constantly going. There are so many components within the National Guard. Uh, they they also work 24 seven in some capacities. And not a lot of people realize that because they just hear, oh, they're just one weekend and then two weeks for full on training and then they're done. When there's active guard and reserve, reserve jobs, a lot of National Guard, they do tech, have technician positions. Uh, so they still work up on the base full time, usually within their own unit. Uh, so it's, or they're also, um, depending on what area in the country you're in, they're under uh, FCERT, which is Fatality Search and Recovery Team, and which is under the Homeland Response Force. And uh, they train, uh, have constant training uh, for any natural disaster within the United States to help recover, you know, any bodies and stuff like that. So that's... Uh, some of the stuff that National Guard still do. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, I think that there's a lot of, you know, folks who kind of don't understand the differences. So thank you for clarifying some of that. And I know um, in talking with you before that you have, you have an EFMP connection. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that story? And that so connection? my family and I are not EFMP, but we do have friends who are, and also in the guard. And the issue, unlike active duty to where when you sign up for the military, you're coded in what's called DEERS. And if you're EFMP, it's in there, it's in that coding. So when uh, your unit pulls up your profile or uh, at least in the Air Force, it's called Military and Family Readiness Center, they're able to identify and uh, they have programs available for you. With the guard, you're not coded in DEERS. So you actually can't identify who your EFMP family are, families are unless it's word, you know, by mouth. Or you you meet someone and you tell them you have a child or a spouse with a disability. Um, and, you know, or if you're seeking help, but you don't know where to go because the programs that are available to active duty aren't always available to guard. So you almost have to, in the military and family readiness center component, they try and create some type of program, some type of support, partner with the chapel to give the families a sense of community and knowing that they're not the only ones struggling and they have someone else to go to. So that's one thing that's that's been difficult within the guard and why we're trying to bring awareness to the situation because it's it's something that every military member should deserve to have, you know, uh, access to the program so they have support. And with the guard and reserve, they don't. Do you happen to know um, or suspect why there isn't, you know, obviously with deers and there's just different processes. Um, yeah. Is it is something that's ever come up? Like how, why, why aren't, why aren't you finding out or centralizing this information? Do you know any justification for why um, they're not included in, in collecting that information that can then be used to help, you know, support families? Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I think it comes down to who would pay for it. Uh, because this, you know, the guard and the reserve, they respond to the state first not the nation. So their, their main job is through either the governor or the senators, you know, coming down when you talk about chain of command versus active duty to where, you know, they, it's direct to the president, you know, they go overseas. Um, but for the garden reserve, they're state 
first. So if a natural disaster happens in a state, they go there. So a lot of the funding too is different. Um, but I don't, I, in the past, I know people have brought it up, but it never really went anywhere, but there's such a need for it now that I really feel that it needs to be reviewed and look to see if we could find some way to, uh, fund or partner, uh, with other programs to, um, you know, give access to these families because when you're when you're an active duty family and on EFMP and you go guard and reserve, you lose everything. You lose all that support. So your spouse or child that is used to being able to go to a certain therapist, have certain medical benefits uh, through the EFMP programs, um, they they lose it all. And you know the the thing is too is the guard we're so used to travel if we have a medical issue we're so used to traveling if we have to and i say we because i still in some way consider ourselves a national guard family because we're still so involved um and it was a big part of our life uh i remember having to travel across the state of washington to um for some medical issues that i had and we were willing to make that travel because they weren't in the area that we were in. So a lot of families travel um, because I know that's been a concern is because uh, with active duty, they usually place the family wherever their medical needs are, you know, for a doctor or something. With guard and reserve families, you have to actually on your own expense, go to the facility. So you make your own choice, whether you're willing to drive five hours or not. Um so, you know, I know a lot of families, I'll play devil's advocate a little here. And, mm -hmm. uh, how, you know, sometimes people think, okay, but you don't have to move around a lot. So, you know, mm -hmm. what is, what's the problem really? You know, and I, I'm not mm -hmm. trying to, I don't no, know, I that kind of thinking, but that's the thinking that some people have. So when it comes to programming that supports National Guard, mm -hmm. can you, can you kind of give some background as to why that logic doesn't necessarily fly, you know? Cause, cause it doesn't, cause even if you don't have to move specifically, uh -huh. what was that wrong? Do you move that we just, you know, is it, what is the lifestyle really like for that families just don't know? Yeah. So national guard, if you want to move, you have the choice to move. I know we just had uh, a friend who they recently moved from Washington state to Florida and he transferred guard units and he's working with the guard unit down in Florida now. So the difference is, is um, you have a choice. Uh, a lot of National Guard, if they don't work on base full time in any capacity, whether it's technician or AGR, they have a civilian job and they're around family more. That's the difference. Um, so you have you have more of a free will to kind of go about how you you want your career to go in the sense of area um, promotions, that kind of stuff. It's a little bit more um, of a choice versus some things you know with active duty we're kind of voluntold as i like to call it to do to do stuff which that's the lifestyle you know um and it's like when i said with promotions too they don't test like uh in the air force you know you test for staff and tech for the guard you board uh for your rank so that's that's also how it's different mm -hmm. um when it comes to your medical you you can be on uh, reserve select, uh, you can, uh, because you're title 32 versus, and that's national guard and reserve versus title 10, which is active duty. And the only time, uh, the national guard is on title 10 is really when they're deployed. And then they're on title 10 for six months. And that's actually, um, where all of a sudden, then if you're on title 10 orders, that's when the national guard families can sign up for the EFMP programs uh, is when they're on Title 10. But when but it happens when it changes and then you're all of a sudden- They have to disenroll and then they lose everything. And that's really the issue. And I feel that that's where the, the it's really unfair because as we all know, it's a process to uh, you know get all your paperwork together and uh, apply for EFMP. And with, you know, with the Air Force, they're deployed for six months you could volunteer for another six if you want to, and then it'd be a year. My husband volunteered for, after six months, another year. 
And then, um, you know, but the problem is when you get back, then you have a timeline before you have to disenroll again. Mm -hmm. And so it's like right when you gain those, uh, those programs and the ability to get your child help or your spouse help um, that they need, whether it's medical or therapist or whatnot, you lose it. Mm-hmm. And so it, it becomes a struggle uh, because within the guard they have before deployments, they have what's called yellow ribbon. And that's a program that, that brings guard families together before deployment. They try to give you all the resources, uh, get introduced to other families who are deploying with your spouses and try and gain some type of support. But, but if you're not deploying, it's, it really is all by word of mouth. It's, it's kind of that constant struggle. You're always having to make decisions, whether or not it's worth, you know, having to move your family for and trade, you know, go to a different guard unit because of their medical issues, or you stay on one side of the state and you travel once a month to the other side to help support. Yeah. And it depends if they have a civilian job or not as well. So, you know, how has, um, COVID and the increased, you know, activation impacted, mm-hmm. you know, the families, because I know that in uh-huh. um, 2019, they did a survey of, yeah. you know, reserve and national guard surveys from spouses perspective. Mm-hmm. Obviously those numbers are not going to reflect this recent yeah. experience. And so what, what have you heard about how has this impacted families and what would you say would be a solution of how we could better support our families who are kind of having to deal with the sustained activation um with a lot of my friends who are gardeners we actually had mike's old unit uh were one of the guard uh units who actually got deployed to dc when everything happened and the thing is is that the national guard they're supposed to be ready 24 7 and they're they could be on a last minute deployment because guard actually, they deploy more than active duty. They're, they're constantly going um, and they're on rotations. You know, it's, it's sad to see that they don't have as much, you know, well, access to those extra programs that active duty does. Cause I feel that, you know, if you're military, you're military, you should have the same benefits regardless if you're active duty or guard. Um, I feel that people who choose to um, join the guard, you know, are no different than people who choose to join active, you know, everyone's journey is different. Um, I feel that we can try and work more together, which is partnering with our active duty counterparts to really, you know, say if active duty is providing a certain program that they allow guard and reserve to come on in, because sometimes that doesn't happen to where they only can uh, have active duty families join and to me that's not right because we have a lot of guard and reserve units on active duty bases um i think there's a way of of really just partnering and helping support support families yeah well it's a, it's it seems like that's the same issue that we're hearing from the uh mm-hmm. coast guard as well because their yeah. money comes from a different pool and therefore they're yeah. not qualified to to have the same types of programs um, yeah. it, it's definitely um one of those things where yes, you know, the pay for the service member Mm -hmm. goes from a different pot, but the families are still in the same situation. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and, and during COVID too, the thing is, is that, um, a lot of guard units been able to telework, but they may have lost a civilian job if they are only traditional. And so they telework during drill weekends, but then now they're either collecting unemployment or they don't have a job. And then you have the, also when it comes to support you, and this is where that's kind of similar, like active duty um, to where you have the men and women who are in AGR positions or tech positions. So they work from home. So they've been home for an entire year and some change. Now everyone's getting back to work back in the office. But now your family, especially if you're married and have kids, your family's so used to you being home. So the transition, and I know some of uh, my friends who are in the guard, uh, they said, you know, that transition of having people home 
and their kids being used to their, you know, their husband or wife being, you know, back and then having to go now back to work. And it's, it's been a hard transition because you're used to them being there. You're used to them helping out. Your kids are used to being able to, to have, you know, play time with their, with their parent or, um, and then now they're just gone automatically. That's actually something we dealt with with my husband in active duty is making sure we give the support to the families after their spouses go back to work because it's hard when you're used to someone being there so long and now they're gone again. And during COVID, a lot of National Guard were active during, um, you know, going pretty much to the front lines as we call it uh, for t- doing COVID tests. So they're now, you know, does my husband stay or uh, wife stay away for a couple of weeks after they get back? You know, do they stay in TLF or, or, you know, that transition to making sure that their families are safe. So it's a constant yeah. back and forth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If, if you were to, to, to make a request of leadership who are making decisions about military family programming, what would mm-hmm. that one request be? Uh, stop separating uh, National Guard and Reserve just because they're not active and allow the programs to be available for any military member regardless and try and find a way to to come up with other programs that could be supported by the state to, you know, allow families to know that they are supported and that people still care about their, you know, their health and safety and n- allowing them to know that they have someone um, because a, sometimes some guard families depending on what they're going through they feel like they have no one uh, and because unless you are that traditional guardsman to where it's one week in a month twice a year uh, the communication is is pretty much through email and you don't know what they're always going through and that's when you start to hear through you know the military grapevine of, oh, this family's EFMP or, oh, they're struggling with this. They need this support. And it's like, well, let's see if we could get them that. But, you know, the National Guard, you have to be creative. Um, But finding more of a way to give the National Guard and Reserve the opportunities to be involved in those programs, especially when you have an active duty family who's been EFMP safe for 15, 20 years, but they go into the guard that they still have that support versus it just being gone completely. There, there has to be a way to allow those programs to be available. So trying to actually sit down, talk to national guard families, talk to active duty families who are transitioning and see what they need and find a way to, to partner together. Because we always talk about that, you know, I'm a key spouse in the air force. And those are kind of those in between between, uh, have you heard that term before? Key spouse? Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So as you know, in between of the civilian and the active duty world, and, and we're trained to support and be there for, for every military member. So, and letting them know that they, they have somebody and, uh, cause it, you could go into a depression if you feel like you don't have the support. So that is definitely something I, uh, would say to definitely look at. Sorry, a little lengthy no, answer. No, not at all. Um, I thank you so much for answering those questions and your time and helping them get some insights into what, you know, our guard families are dealing with and and how we can kind of come around and support each other. Um, mm-hmm. So if, you know, you find somebody in your active duty and you, you d- discover that someone's, you know, EFMP as well, and they happen to be um, mm-hmm. National Guard, you know, maybe ask them, (laughs) what are they, what what are their needs and how can we help them? Because even if um, the programs aren't there, we are each other's community. So thank you so much, Brandy, for for chatting. Mm